celebrate uh, the anniversary of E3S. And today's uh, uh, topic will be on the sensory evaluation of non-food products. Um, so this is um, organized by the uh, E3S uh, working group dedicated to the evaluation of non-food products. And just to uh, give you a brief story about that group, um, this is a um, um, discussion that started in 2016, I think, um, when we organized uh, actually um, the, the SFIS, the French Society, organized uh, a first or created the first working group dedicated to non-food after uh, we organized the, um, uh, the E3S uh, conference in Paris. And we had the first discussion at the uh, at the European level, and then uh, very soon after that, we decided to uh, uh, create a group on uh, on dedicated to non-food products. I remember that we met uh, probably for the first time in Dublin, uh, and then officially created the group. And from that on, the members of the focus group, thanks to uh, um, um, Anne Marie uh, Pancel Héritier and Irene. Uh, Céline was there too, Céline Marc. We, uh, or they, <laughs> decided to uh, um, uh, try to um, um, gather expertise and experiences and to uh, uh, write a book about that, uh, uh, that very, uh, very broad topic. Uh, so that was the, the start of the adventure. And now, uh, a few years later, we made it. And uh, many of you are contributors to, to that book uh, that was just published uh, uh, a week ago, I think. So, um, UP, we are very happy. And now I will leave the floor to Anne Marie, who will introduce the uh, uh, different speakers for today. Thank you, uh, Julien. Hi, everybody. In the meantime, Thank I forgot to say that uh, nice there, there are. Uh, 120 people uh, registered for attending the webinar, so I think they, they are joining, joining us. Yeah. Okay, thank you. It's a great number. So it's a big success and uh, we are very uh, happy to be here today and share all together all, uh, all our expertise in non-food sensory uh, application. So uh, today's uh, organization uh, uh, is following. Uh, First, we will listen to four speakers. The, um, the presentation is recorded uh, to be sure to be uh, on time. And uh, so we will uh, listen to uh, Lee Dreyfus, uh, who is presented uh, the, uh, the emotion uh, approach. Then uh, we will have um, uh, Céline Marc uh, in the application in the cosmetic field followed by uh, Liz and Nicola and Margaret concerning uh, pharmaceutical application. And our last speaker is uh, Thibault uh, Vallet for the acceptability in pharmaceutical application. After the 20 minutes of presentation, uh, uh, the moderator will, uh, will uh, animate the debate concerning the first four presentations uh, during uh, 15 to 30 minutes. And then uh, we, uh, we will uh, uh, we will have the four other presentations uh, concerning um, flowers with uh, Renan Simono, uh, sports materials with uh, Mathilde Child from Decathlon, um, uh, Julien Rogue for the pet food, and unfortunately he cannot be here, but uh, he, he, he has uh, prepared a very nice uh, presentation. And uh, our last but uh, not the least, uh, I don't remember, I have a, please, please help me. Uh, Renan, Mathilde, and okay, thank you. Nobody. No. To... <laughs> Renan and Barbara and Barbara. Sorry for that. For the... yeah, Barbara. Back. I'm back. Okay. <laughs> And Barbara for the pack. Okay, and then we have another debate during the uh, 20 minutes before uh, in the conclusion of uh, this uh, webinar. So, thank you, David, to the author of this uh, original first book of non sensory evaluation. Thanks, thanks a lot. And we thank deeply the speaker for the 
preparation of this uh, of their presentation and to be here uh, today. So now I let Hello, so I am Liz Dreyfus and I will present you chapter four about measurements of emotions and their applications to non-food products. So um, I wrote this chapter with my colleague Boriana Atanasova. She is professor at the University of Tours and she is researcher in eye brain and more especially in the neurofunctional psychiatry team. And I am associate professor at the University of Tours and also innovation manager at SAM Sensory and Marketing International, which is a market research agency. So um, this chapter first uh, contains a review of um, the main measurements methods that exist for measuring emotions. So um, as you can see here, we investigated four big uh, methods uh, which already exist for food products, but we each time uh, applied them to non-food products and highlighted their um, how they work with non-food uh, products and uh, what are the limits or the advantages of each method uh, when applied to non-food uh, domains. So, um, as you know, emotions they have a cognitive dimension, and this cognitive dimension. Um, translates into um, reporting of the assessors of the emotions they have um, they have felt. So we investigate the self-report measures with verbal and non-verbal methods. Then emotions, they translate into one or several physiological events and through electroencephalography or autonomous nervous system function measures, we investigate how we can use physiological measures to to measure this um, dimension of the emotion. Uh, the third part of this chapter is dedicated to uh, observation and behavioral measures, especially facial, vocal, and body uh, measurements, body expressions measurements. And they are particularly interesting in the non-food uh, domain uh, because very often uh, using physiological or even uh, brain imaging measures uh, are is very difficult or even impossible for some non-food uh, stimuli, uh, while observing um, the assessors or the subjects who perceive uh, the emotion can be um, more, let's say, um, direct to measure the emotions and easier to set up. So we, we, we spend uh, some time to highlight the advantages uh, of these observation and behavioral measures. And we also, uh, discuss the reliability and how to ensure the validity of these measures. And finally, we, we finish with the fMRI, so brain ima imaging techniques. And um, we really investigated these uh, emotion measures um, for a large array of non-food sectors. So we took examples in fragrances, cosmetic products, sports, automobile, medicine, packaging, and also advertising and music. And we try to highlight um, for each type of measure uh, what is feasible and what is uh, more complex for each of these um, different non-food fields. Hi, I'm Céline Marc. I'm Principal Scientist Sensory and Consumer Science in Oriflame R&D in Bray, in Ireland. And today I will introduce you the Chapter 9 about sensory methods for cosmetic evaluation. I was invited early November 2019 to write this chapter by Irene and uh, Anne-Marie. But I couldn't imagine to do it alone, as I knew them, I knew their experience in this area, in this field, and over us all today, all together, 
we had 75 years of experience. So when we started building this chapter, we thought about the content and how we wanted to build it. And it was important for us to give a good summary about how sensory and consumer science were done for cosmetic products, but also to give some tips, advice, and really a lot of practical example that we share in the chapter. And this is summarized in the last sentence of our introduction about sensory methods are now widely used in cosmetic company. And the purpose of this chapter is to offer a, a pragmatic point of view of their selection and their implementation. We started um, so this chapter by speaking about cosmetic and senses, and we focus on vision and touch, and we explain the different sensory mechanisms involved. We also made a huge part in the chapter about general requirements when we explain and detail how do we adapt food sensory method to cosmetic evaluation. And we focus on sampling and how we present the different sample to the panelists, but also the condition and how we adapt the sensory proof testing to cosmetic evaluation, as you can see in the picture. We also um, detail the different body areas that we can use depending of the cosmetic product tested and how do we explain sometimes depending of the test method involved to the panelists how to apply it or to the consumer and where to apply it. As you can understand, it's not the same process for applying a skincare product like a day cream or night cream than a lipstick on the lips and a mascara on the eyelashes, for example. Then going on in this part, we explain and define our panel type and we are using so consumer but we are more calling them as user of the product type that we will test it. So we are very focusing on some different inclusion criteria and food sensory studies in a way because for us frequency of usage, skin type and skin intensity can be some criteria of inclusion to be part of a consumer test for example. We also train expert panel and we detail this um, into the chapter. And we also had as a third category that we call professional panelists when we work with health stylists or beautician because we really want them to have their expert opinion as professional but also to make an assessment as close as we like for a sensory measurement. We describe also how we set up studies and we give some examples about questionnaire results and attributes that we can use. So you can see in this table, we give example of attributes that can be applied for a foundation product, but also mascara with a definition and a protocol of how to assess it by an expert panel in this case. Then um, we describe the descriptive test as sensory profile or QDA and more the hedonic part with the in-use test in our case, so the consumer test. But we also mention the descriptive test that we can use and some challenge that we have. As you can understand, we just have one mouth, so two lips or two eyes that we can use on the panelist. It was important in this chapter to give practical example. So we choose to have two studies. So one about skincare and the body lotion. So it's more the emission part in this case. And the second one about a makeup product and a lipstick and about the changing or of material about the lipstick that I received from a request from one of, one of my colleagues. So we wanted to show the result of these findings, but also we wanted to share in the chapter how we proceed and how we did to answer to this request. As a conclusion, we wanted to share our view when where sensory science is going for cosmetic evaluation. And thanks to digital technology, we thought that we will go in even more real life feedback that we will get, for example, in a shower in our case, who is very important for getting a good liking and a, an accurate hedonic uh, feedback. But also the second part was hugely important. In our case, emotion and all of this area is under huge um, development in our field. And we see this coming for the next year still. 
So thanks a lot for watching and listening this quick overview of this chapter. I'm ready for your question later on, and you have our detail if you have thought about something else later. Thank you. It is fair to say that sensory sight is not well established within the pharmaceutical industry. In this chapter, we bring together key information for both sensory scientists and the pharma sector, exploring why the pharma sector needs sensory science, showing where sensory science fits in the medicinal product development process, and outlining the challenges for sensory science in medicinal development. We know that safety, quality, and how the medicine works are key considerations in its development, the successful administration of a course of treatment to a patient, and most importantly, their compliance in completing it is what makes a medicine effective. And for this to work, the medicine needs to be acceptable to the patient. In this chapter, we explore what that means for the pharma sector. We explain what acceptability means in the context of a medicinal product. It is well established that there are two groups in particular that require medicine to be specifically developed for them, namely younger or pediatric patients and older or geriatric patients. And indeed, one of the key motivations for the pharma sector to engage with the use of sensory science in the development of new medicinal products has to be guidelines from, from the EMA and the FDA, who've highlighted that acceptability assessment should be investigated during the development of medicines for children. Moving on from why the pharma sector needs sensory science, I will now hand you over to Nicholas, who will explain how our chapter shows where sensory fits into the medicinal product development process. Thank you. Well, thank you, Elise. So now let's understand a bit more the pharmaceutical development and where sensory science is. So um, the first step is the drug discovery and to cancer and many families of a new disease to be treated. And the better candidate at this stage will move to step two, which is a preclinical test where we can already ask some sensory tests, especially on the visual, smell aspects, but also on the use and the concept. With, then we will send the result to the regulatory agencies asking to start the clinical trials that the third one. And this, in this one, we got three sub steps where we increase the number of participants. The importance of sensory science here is we can have information of the first things to assessment of on the acceptability and accountability. And also, we can do some sensory tests to the panel on placebos. And we send back all the research to the regulatory agencies asking for marketing approval. And if the drug is approved, then we are in step four, where we can uh, focus more on the satisfactory survey, but also uh, the reformation needs. So in global, the process of developing a new drug is complex, but it is important to face the challenge based. And that will be the next part where Margaret will be going more depth, talking about the challenge. Thank you, Nicholas. So what are the challenges for sensory science in medicinal development? The process of drug development must ensure that the benefits of the drug outweigh its risks. It is vital to acknowledge that there are risks in taking any drugs. Medicine designed to be consumed orally also need to be palatable which can only be reliably measured by volunteers through the use of sensory science. Requirements for preventing toxicity and maintaining the safety of volunteers who taste the drug is one of the main challenges that is faced by researchers. The oversight which is required to mitigate safety concerns includes the following. Ethical and or regulatory approval to carry out the study. The study to be carry out, carried out to GCP standard, informed consent to be obtained from volunteers or panelists, specialist recruitment considering medical inclusion exclusion criteria, and research conducted by a multidisciplinary team of sensory scientists and clinicians. Now, in order to successfully implement sensory science within the new pharmaceutical development process, it is vital now that an internationally harmonized protocol is developed to include development of hybrid methodologies and tools, sensory acuity of volunteers, number of volunteers, when to use trained and naive volunteers, scales and questionnaires design, 
And finally, the question of what is considered a palatable medicine must be explored so that the development of formulations that adequately meet the needs of the end user, that is the patient, can be supported with reliable and credible sensory science. This concludes the three excerpts from our chapter. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to address this webinar and to present the 16th chapter co-authored by Anne-Marie Poncelleritier, Professor at Hebei, Fabrice-Suisse, Research CEO, and myself. I'm Thibault Vallet, research scientist and project leader at CleanSearch, a clinical research organization supporting innovation in the field of patient-centered care. Today, let's talk about the standardization of multidimensional assessments. As you know, many pivotal concepts such as preference, liking, and acceptability are driven by the characteristics of each user, such as their sex, age, culture, or those of the product, like palatability or usability, as well as the context of use, obviously. Providing comprehensive scores for this multifaceted concept remains challenging. The difficulty of such evaluations is compounded in vulnerable populations that require particular sensory and consumer testing techniques. And this is of particular importance for those people as the design of suitable products must take into account their specific needs. To illustrate how a multifaceted concept can be assessed and better grasped, we focus on medicine acceptability in pediatric and older populations. In recent years, acceptability has merged as a key factor for treatment effectiveness in those vulnerable populations, because very simply, drugs don't work in patients who don't take them. For a long time, in the field of pharmaceutics, the crucial endpoints of efficacy and safety concealed all the user needs. Furthermore, the very strict regulatory framework isn't making it easy. And secondly, standardized assessment of acceptability is long overdue and knowledge remains fragmented. The first step of our approach is to identify valid and reliable measures covering the many aspects of the concept being assessed. Here, we use different observational measures as many patients from the population of interest are not able to provide relevant self-evaluation due to development or deterioration of physical and cognitive skills. Thereafter, a data set including many assessments of references from the right spectrum of products and users should be collected to reflect the diversity of user behavior. After that, let's start mining the data set with multivariate analysis using MCA and clustering. The idea is to summarize the key information into an intelligible and useful reference framework. Once the accuracy and consistency of the measure provided has been demonstrated, we can use the tool to improve knowledge on the concept being assessed. As you can see, it's a continuous process with an ongoing collection of additional data and feedback loops. Here, we simply have to position the elements of interest at the very center of their evaluation on the 3D map juxtaposing true acceptability profile. Using the acceptability reference framework in pediatrics, we have, for instance, highlighted acceptability differences due to the age of patient, the place of administration, the administration device, the drug, or the flavor composition. For some flavor, the data indicates presently significant acceptability variations depending on patient sex. For example, antibiotics flavor with lemon were positively accepted in both but not in young girls. In older people, swallowing disorders are widespread disability leading to major issues for oral medicine intake. In standard practices, liquid formulations are commonly used in this patient, despite their inability to swallow large volumes of liquids. Our research has shown, for example, that raw disposable tablets or tablets, hard tablets, smaller than 6.5 mm in length were more appropriate than oral liquid formulation in those patients. Today, more than 5,000 evaluations of medicine intake have been collected 
and a great deal of valuable knowledge extracted from this data. Beyond the health sector, we believe that such data-driven approach could be of full interest to better grasp multifaceted concepts in many different fields, especially in vulnerable populations. Thanks for your attention. Enjoy the read of the chapter. And now, I'll be pleased to further discuss the topic through the live question and session. So thank you for the first speaker and thanks a lot for the preparation of the of the video. So uh, I, uh, I will ask, uh, yes, uh, Barbara, if you want to, maybe uh, as you are moderator, if you want to ask the first question, we have few questions. On, uh, so I repeat, uh, the, you have to write your question in the right part of the of your screen. And the, there is a blue triangle. You can ask question, and we can read the question and ask to to the speaker. I let you the floor, Barbara, for the first question. If you if you agree. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Yes, you can uh, hear you. Okay, so um, hello to everybody. My name is Barbara Sigmund from Graz University of Technology, uh, and I'm happy to be the moderator of this session. Uh, I just scrolled through the the question that are written in the in the Q and A session, uh, and uh, should we start probably in the order of the of the talk? So we we could start with the questions for Lise. Uh, so there there are quite a few one. Uh, sorry, Lise, you were the the one who who asked the questions. Uh, actually, there are, there's one question by Sarah. Uh, and Sarah would like to know which method uh, do you think is most useful to measure emotional responses to cosmetics? Okay, uh, well, thank you. Um, well, I would say it depends <laughs> on, on the type of product um, you're talking about. Um, using using uh, emotional measurement methods is, is really a challenge in uh, in non-food and uh, not only in cosmetics but in other categories um i mean with food you can use uh, quite a lot of, of methods but as soon as you are moving uh, using um i don't know using a, a shower gel under your shower or using um a mascara that uh, puts your hands in front of your eye, uh, you have lots of um, emotional measures that are impossible to use. So for example, um, face reading, uh, face reading when uh, you are not in front of a face reader device, face reading device, or uh, when you're in your shower, or when you're yeah moving or turning your, um, your face to apply the, the makeup, uh, it becomes quite impossible to measure um, facial expressions um, with the traditional, let's say, uh, facial expression methods. Um, other very easily understandable thing, uh, physio physiological measures like uh, skin conductance measures or uh, or uh, heart, heart rate, uh, they are also very difficult to set up when you're in your shower or when you are uh, moving. Um, for example, when you are rubbing a skincare cream on your body, you are creating uh, movements. You are uh, you are doing uh, yeah. Your body is moving, and uh, you are creating some physiological events that are not related to uh, the product, but to the fact that you are uh, doing the application. And then um, measuring uh, um, breathing rate or heart rate or skin conductance. You get data, but it's difficult to sort out what is uh, the origin of, of this data. Is it the product? Is it the, the gesture? So I would say that in cosmetics, what I have seen uh, in my experience, we still use lots of um, report um, measures. So either verbal or nonverbal. Uh, so related to the cognitive part of the emotion. So it's not measuring live um, emotions, it's report, uh, measuring reported emotions. So the emotions that you, you declare having just felt uh, before while using the product. So this is something you have to have in mind. It is uh, 
projected emotions and not uh, emotions live. Um, and I will say that, um, okay, I said that facial expressions are difficult to measure, but observation, um, so observing a uh, number of times a movement is done, for example, for, um, I don't know, um, mascara application or lipstick application, uh, number of times you are doing a gesture or um, the, the movements of your face, of your body, uh, they can be uh, cues uh, of emotions. It's true that it's not a direct measure of emotions, but uh, all these um, measurements all together, all this information can give you um, an indication of the emotion felt. I would say uh, that in cosmetics, as in other um, categories, um, don't use only one method. They are all complementary, and I would recommend as much as possible uh, to, to, to combine them. Okay. Uh, that also answers my question because I was wondering how we, you would measure the emotions on a tennis racket as you showed in one of your pictures. Uh, and Anne-Marie, I think that uh, at least covered quite a lot of the of the areas that you were, were asking for. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah, I yeah. would just add, uh, yeah, add that, for example, if you want to, to measure the facial, facial expressions, uh, I, I would say that um, when sniffing a fragrance or when playing video games, or when looking at an advertising, maybe you have a larger array of uh, emotional measures that are available and that are uh, feasible than when you are uh, testing a new racket and you are playing uh, tennis or you're driving a car. So um, uh, fragrances uh, is, um, is a domain that we investigated a lot and where we found uh, more literature and uh, usage of a large array of uh, emotional measures than in other non-food domains. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Liz. Uh, I did not find any questions uh, regarding. No, this is a clinical trial uh, as well uh, regarding your lecture. And due to the very limited uh, time period that we have, uh, I, I propose to move on to Celine. Uh, um, thank you, Liz. Uh, Celine, there are there are a few questions. Um, I just read the first one uh, that was given by Lise, actually. Do you tackle the topic of variability between volunteers? How do I ensure that variability of skin is covered, for example, in a sniff test? And maybe that goes somehow hand in hand with the second question. Uh, how would you recreate specific panels, for example, for example, a, a panel for, for persons with dry skin? Or is that something you would not, not consider these differences in the skin type? Uh, very interesting question. Hello, everybody. Um, I will start by the um, question about recruiting a dry skin. Personally, when I need to recruit a specific panel, it's more in the case of consumer tests or in-use tests that is, a, is my, um, I would say, my goal more, you know, when we are doing uh, in-use at home and we have a specific range for dry skin, I really focus on this inclusion criteria. It's very important. For a sensory profile, I think think is more common to recruit a panel with different skin type and depending I would say about the methodology if you train them on the face for skincare product or on the forearm that some people are also doing is maybe not so important and depending also which kind of attribute you are searching for like uh, what we call us in oriflame is more a pre-screening so we have a list of attributes that can be assessed on the forearm and then in this case the dry skin criteria is not as relevant uh, or not as important or if it's on the face definitely it will be maybe one of the criteria but you will need to, to specifically train a panel for this range and this as uh, this purpose and regarding your other question about sniff test I don't think I'm able to answer to this question <laughs> Sorry, not, it was a sniff test of deodorants for example yeah yeah I would say that is not my area of expertise I don't really, I would say, do this kind of, you know, uh, test uh, in Oriflame. So I'm not sure I, I'm, I'm able to answer to this question. Maybe Irene or, or Anne-Marie have seen this before. Irene, would you like to comment on that? <laughs> or Anne-Marie? <laughs> 
um, no, and I, I work with uh, with deodorant, but um, um, for the sniff test, I, I don't really. Yes, we, we prefer to recruit people who have problem of odor, but uh, it's not very it's not very simple uh, to uh, to work uh, with. And now I I would say I'm very much experiment in that field also. Okay. Yes, we uh, we often compare two two perfumes or to, to give some preferences, but uh, or to see if uh, uh, there is a off flavor developed in a triangle test, for example, or or uh, but. Uh, in cosmetics and it's always good to to compare and uh, the type of the skin doesn't uh, interfere in the comparison uh, less interfere less than when it's in a consumer test so it depends if the, if the method is developed in the laboratory or outside of the laboratory mm -hmm. I don't know if I uh, answered the question. Yeah, because you know, when you are testing a deodorant, um, one deodorant can give you a very different uh, impression on uh, on three different people who sweat uh, more or less. And my question is, if I want to compare uh, four deodorants, uh, do I have to, um, to apply these deodorants on uh, several volunteers and then make an average of the different volunteers? Um, it's like in, um, in food when you have very... Uh, uh, variability uh, in yes. the batch, uh, yes. within batch. So yes. um, for the other ones, they use uh, two or three expert panelists, and they apply the the deodorant, and they before they test the other of the people without the deodorant, and after with the deodorant, and they compare uh, the the notes. Uh, but it's always good or not good. Uh, we we don't uh, feel the the previous order, and uh, the it's it's compared in the time and the other time, and the the boss the boss. Uh, the boss uh, oh, Armpits, yeah. Yeah. Yes. I, if I can jump in, um, there are two types of approaches. You can uh, work with, if you work on the efficiency of the deodorant, you can have a, a panel of uh, volunteers uh, on whom to you apply the, the deodorant to. But these guys don't just, they won't be the one who smell, right? Uh, so they're not the sensory panelists per se. Uh, so that's one way to work. But if you go to more to the uh, consumer evaluation, then it's self evaluation, which is a different yes. story. And uh, I don't know if anyone in uh, in the workshop uh, works in a company that makes or tests the other end and they want to share something, their experience. Yes, and in the laboratory, uh, they, they have some boxes with uh, 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 a, a place where the people are um, behind a wall and uh, the panelists cannot see the people because uh, there is the influence of the people in the smell we are, we are going to, to, to feel. So we have to, the panelists have to not see the, the, the people really. They see only the place they are sniffing. Okay. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry that I have to stop yes. this interesting discussion on this, on this topic here, uh, but due to uh, this limited time slot, we have to move on to the third presentation, sensory evaluation of pharmaceutical products, or uh, not pharmaceutical, uh, medicinal products. Uh, and there are two really interesting questions, one given by Renaud, uh, probably a, a, a slightly provocative question. 
as you mentioned, so I thought that the medicines were bad, bitter or bitter to prevent abuse. Uh, if they are good, is there not a risk of overdosage? Uh, so I don't know who of you, Nicola, or who of you would like to comment on that? I, I can start to comment start, on that. To start, and then mm -hmm. you can go on the second question, maybe. Okay. So, so um, the in kind of the bitterness of the medicines, they are normally quite bitter. And the role of the development of new medicinal products, they want to hide uh, as much as they need to the bitterness of the drugs because the active, active pharmaceutical ingredients are quite bitter originally. So they are, it's kind of reverse. So the medicine are not made bitter, they are made less bitter to be acceptable, but not too much liked. It's okay. The in between because we cannot do the overdose, we cannot look like a candy as well for children. So all that, those issues are interacting during the development of new uh, medicinal products. And but originally the medicine are quite bitter, and <laughs> you don't want to taste <laughs> the original medicine because you won't take it like several times. You just will take one and stopped. So it would be more uh, how we can hide the bitterness a bit, but not too much, because we don't want to do the overdose. Okay. Uh, and if you want to add something, Liz, uh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah thank you, Nicholas. Um, with medicine, um, the APIs, as Nicholas said, are quite often bitter. They're not just bitter, they can be sulfurous as well. There can be some also other nasty flavors as well as, as tastes. Um, now, that has an impact on patients' compliance but actually taking the medicine. So what we're trying to help um, pharmaceutical companies to do is to make sure that the medicines they develop are good enough, are acceptable enough for people to be able to comply taking them. So if you can imagine as a child, um, you're being given a, a medicine that's extremely bitter every single day, well then the compliance, in other words, that you would want to take this medicine may not be as high as it should be. So there's an awful lot of money lost um, and people not taking their medicine. And so, so people not taking their full treatments as a result of medicine being um, unacceptable uh, and, and, and quite often bitter. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And there is a second question, very interesting question uh on the time it takes from the planning for sensory testing within the clinic trying um, uh, trial uh, to finish phase three uh and to bring the product uh, on the market uh and with the addition do you test the effects of the drugs into sensory at the same time so very much related to development or at which stage of development of the of the medicinal product uh, you do the sensory testing So, Margaret, do you want to take this? Or will I? I'm just going to or jump in. Um, oh, yeah. Hi. Okay. Okay. Um, so, yeah, there's two there's two situations here, I guess. Um, we're looking at, um, let's say, the development, the, the developmental stage of the medicine, um, whereby um, one would consider, is there um, a sensory tasting component um, part of, of that, um, I suppose, step of the process? Um, obviously, as you can imagine, in the earlier stages of developing medicine, um, you know, from a, let's say, a safety perspective, um, we can't, um, you know, ingest the medicine um, for obvious reasons. So there's different, I suppose, layers associated with, um, with, doing, uh, with conducting sensory science, I suppose, in the broader sense. Um, typically, tasting the medicine to ensure it's acceptable is generally done at the end of the process. Uh, where we use uh, volunteers. However, along the, 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 the you know, the, the supply chain, um, you know, of developing the product, you know, there's certain things that we can look at in terms of, you know, maybe, uh, you know, some type of aroma tests and some other um, elements of ensuring that, you know, whatever part of, of tasting the product that, you know, it's safe to do so. So I guess it's, it's a kind of a two-prong approach. Okay, thank you very much. I think these were the questions concerning the third uh, presentation and uh, there is one short one 
uh, for Thibault. Uh, and uh, Michele would like to know which kind of uh, software you use for your multi um, uh, dimensional assessments. Thibault, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, for the analysis, I've been using her. But uh, of course, we can use uh, all the different kind of software. Uh, for in in pharmaceutical science, uh, there are agencies like to use SAS. Uh, so we have cross-checked uh, our, our result using the SAS software too. And uh, the analysis are just MCA or clustering things like that. So yes, you can perform it with uh, with all the different uh, software that that you want. I just want to add uh, to to add something regarding the, the, the previous question and to uh, to talk about acceptability regarding to the uh, to the use of acceptability testing during the different phase of uh, of drug development. Uh, in, from our side, the acceptability study are uh, performed. Um, during the same study that uh, safety and efficacy with another endpoint. Uh, safety and efficacy will be the primary endpoint, things like that, and uh, acceptability will be um, a secondary endpoint. Okay. So thanks to all for your contributions. We are already five minutes ahead, uh, and I'm sorry that I have to stop the discussion here. Uh, there are a few more questions that popped up in the Q&A section. Uh, probably those of you um, who could answer the questions, probably you could answer them just by typing the answers in the in the Q&A session, uh, just not to to skip them uh, in any way. Okay, so thanks for contributing to this session, and I think we continue with the uh, with the second uh, uh, group of uh, contributions. Thank you. Hello and good afternoon. My name is Barbara Sigmund. I am a food and sensory scientist from Graz University of Technology and I'm also the chairwoman of the Austrian Sensory Society. I will now give you some ideas on chapter 7 of our book in which we cope with the identification of off flavor derived from packaging material. In everyday life we are faced with a large number of packaging materials. Food products, cosmetics and pharmaceutical products need appropriate packaging materials. When we consider what to expect from a packaging material, then we expect that the packaged good is protected from any influence from the exterior, that the package may give a certain shape to the product and that the package carries the design and the information for the product. On the contrary, what we do not expect is that the packaging material interacts with the product and in the worst case that the packaging material alters the flavor properties of the product. But unfortunately, this is very often the case. There are several ways of interactions between the product and its packaging material. And when we deal with this topic, we need to understand these interactions. Imagine this grey bowl is a certain type of food or cosmetics packed in any type of container. First of all, migration may occur. In this case, volatiles that are genuine to the packaging material may migrate into the packaged good and may impact the sensory properties. Volatiles might also be formed in the packaging material due to influences from the exterior such as UV irradiation and increased temperatures. Our flavor may also be evoked by permeative processes where volatiles from the surroundings permeate through the packaging material. So we can see that there are several possible ways of interaction that we need to keep in mind. All the physical or chemical processes may lead to an alteration of the flavor of the packaged product. And I have to say that in most cases, these processes negatively impact the product quality. When it comes to sensory evaluation of the packaging material, it is extremely important to note that in this context, we do not answer hedonic questions if we like or dislike the odor of the packaging material, but that it is a strictly analytic question. We aim to gain detailed characterization of the perceived off odor 
and to generate as much information as possible to set up targeted instrumental analysis for the final identification and quantification of the off-flavor causing compounds. When we have a look at the sensory methods that are applied for this purpose, we can group these methods into two groups. Firstly, we use so-called direct methods where we evaluate the odor that is emitted from the packaging material. Secondly, there are indirect methods where the packaging material is exposed together with a certain food matrix and after the exposure, the food is evaluated and not the packaging material itself. The methods that are used for the sensory evaluation are the same as we know for the evaluation of food, mainly descriptive methods with or without intensity ratings or discrimination tests as shown in the lower picture. However, sample preparation is different and in many cases quite challenging and requires special attention. There are some additional points that need to be addressed in this context. Firstly, we have to face the fact that suitable material for draining purposes is not as easily available as for the sensor evaluation of food or cosmetics, neither is reference material. Secondly, we need to have in mind that the range of available packaging materials is extremely broad and that the development of new materials such as biodegradable products is ongoing and that we do only have little knowledge about the possible interactions with packaged goods. The presence of printing colors and glues add additional complexity to this problem. Finally, two specific points need to be mentioned. Firstly, the topic of sensory thresholds that are most probably completely different to those in food matrices. And the second point is, at least in my opinion, of very high importance. Very often, we only have little knowledge on the identity of the off-flavor causing compounds. In case we suspect any toxicological issues with respect to these volatiles, we have to refrain from sensory evaluation, as the health of our panelists must be of highest priority. Last but not least, I would like to emphasize that the question of off-flavor and packaging material is a highly interdisciplinary task. Of course, we need sensory scientists to identify and describe the perceived off odor, but we need the analytical chemists to identify and quantify the compounds. We need chemists to understand the chemistry of the packaging material. We need food or pharmaceutical chemists to understand the interaction between the product and the packaging material. And we need technologists to understand and to mitigate the technological process. So finally, if you're interested in this topic, visit chapter 7 of our book, and I will also be happy to answer questions in the discussion. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Mathilde Charles. I'm R&D engineer at Decathlon Sports Lab. The goal of this presentation is to present to you some key points regarding uh, sensory analysis on sports products its specificities and the challenges we try to face. Sensory evaluation on sport products springs from the interaction between three main things. The products, the sport people who will test the product and the activity they will perform. As it is not so common to work with sports products in the area of sensory analysis, I wanted to specify what is it. Sport products include different categories, notably clothes, footwear, equipment, here the bike, and accessories, here the flask. Their evaluations require, most of the time, the sense of touch, even though other senses occasionally are involved. We study, for example, shoe cushioning, fabric softness, or grip of tennis racket. Depending on the product, the evaluation will be done through the whole body or different body parts, for example, only feet or hands. As a consequence, it is sometimes difficult to discriminate products as tactile acuity is less accurate for some body parts, notably legs, arms and the back. Furthermore, products need to be experienced during sport practice to be evaluated correctly. This point concerns both hedonic evaluation and descriptive or discriminative evaluation. To be experienced, sport products need to be tested during practice, as said before. This means most of the time going out of the lab. 
testing environment can be indoor, uh, at home or in a gym, or outdoor. Outdoor testing is particularly challenging as subjective to climatic conditions, for example, uh, subjective to a variation of temperature, humidity, but also variation for uh, snow or ground condition, making differentiation hardly reproducible. It is also challenging to test product out of the lab as we need to have and use transportable data acquisition tools. This can be done easily with paper questionnaire, as it was done commonly many years ago, and also with electronic devices such as smartphones or tablets. Nevertheless, these tools can be used only before or after uh, sport practice in our case. To avoid this problem and allow the data collection during practice, we developed our own connected watch. Thus, sensory and consumer questionnaires can be submitted easily at some specific time. Regarding some uh, sports people, I wanted to highlight three main points affecting the evaluation. Firstly, level of sports people can obviously affect recruitment of participants and test session organization. Indeed, sport people with different levels will have different needs, expectations and preferences. But they also use very different equipment and have a different uh, perception and uh, sensitivity. Secondly, sizing. It is almost a philosophical question. Should we give to participants product from the size they are supposed to wear or the size of product they are used to wear? Depending on the question investigated, we'll go for one option or the other. Finally, physical fatigue needs to be taken into account as it affects sensory perception. Testation organization and number of evaluated products must be adapted. To conclude, to be performed, sensory analysis on sport products need some methodological adaptation linked to, for example, number of attributes to be evaluated or number of evaluated products or product presentation. More details are presented in the book chapter illustrated with three case studies. Now, I just have to thank you for your attention. Hello everyone, I am going to present to you the chapter to which I have contributed about the sensory evaluation and its application to ornamental plants. The aim of this chapter is to discuss adaptation and the use of sensory and consumer sciences methodologies for the particular sectors and products. But to begin with, I suggest that you project yourself as a simple consumer. Imagine that you are in a garden center that you want to buy a plant for your garden or your balcony. How do you behave? Which plant do you choose and why? Why is this plant here and not this one be just behind? And what are the attributes that are driving your choices? And you know, there is a lot of questions we can ask about consumer expectation and so when, when there are uh, selected plants uh, in the garden center. In this sector that is struggling to find new consumers who must innovate, the breeders, producers, distributors need information about consumers. And to our knowledge, this industry, this sector is not familiar with our sensory methodologies and, and more generally uh, about the marketing methodologies. Uh, even the sensory methodologies are relevant because plants are multi-sensory products. Obviously, the visual is decisive. The appearance, the shape, the size are very important, but we must not forget the other dimension. The smells, of course, of uh, the rose and all the plants. The flavor, and notably for uh, aromatic plants, for edible flowers, uh, the flavor could be also very important, but we can also integrate the textures uh, of leaves and uh, of the grass. You know, the, the comfort when you are, uh, uh, when, when you have a nap uh, in your garden is probably driven by the quality of the texture of the grass. And, and we also can uh, integrate uh, the, the sound uh, when it comes as an example, to study the impact of plants uh, on the sound environment of a room. 
But to implement the sensory, we must take into account the specificity of plants. Because, you know, the, the plants are uh, often with a big size, they are heavy, yeah, there, there is some stuff, uh, they have sometimes thorns. Um, and there is another point that's very variable. Um, they are variable within the batch. From one day to another, they can change. And even within the day, you can have a change in the flower and, and things like that. Uh, this is why in this chapter we discuss all this methodological consideration and the implementation of the sensory in this particular field. Uh, we discuss uh, how to manage this variability. Uh, we discuss also uh, uh, if we can, if we if we have to use the uh, pictures, videos, or we outlines and and the advantage of uh, uh, or drawbacks of these different uh, conditions. If we have to work in lab or in contact situation or at home and. And again, what are the, the, the advantages of each uh, uh, context? We also discuss about the consumers and, and which consumers we have and, and how to qualify the consumers and notably with the question of expertise and, and how to qualify them. Um, then we present and discuss some example of sensory characterization, uh, focus on appearance and uh, on the odor uh, and how it can help agronomists to better describe their product. Um, we also present some examples of studies done with ornamental plants, mainly rose, uh, since it's the main plant cell of the world, but all the plants too. Uh, those studies uh, aim to identify drivers of liking and balance between intrinsic sensory and extrinsic variables. Uh, there are some examples of consumer tests, preference mapping, conjoint analysis with or without extrinsic variables, and sometimes completed uh, using quantitative survey. But there is also an example of a study aiming to identify consumer behaviors using qualitative study focus groups, uh, also eye tracking methodology, and uh, home use test and other methodology. From, from our perspective, and if it was uh, exciting to, to work on that, uh, there is a very strong potential uh, in the use of sensory and consumer sciences for the ornamental plant sector. This sector must remain competitive as others. And but in order to, to do so, it must, uh, it must innovate, create, propose new products and new uses, and it must reach new consumers and keep current consumers also. And this is why uh, these methodologies have a major interest to our point of view. We believe uh, that our methodology could be implemented uh, in the different stage of product innovation, you know, from early breeding program. Uh, to, to the launch on the market and to evaluate the performance of the plants when they are on the market. So we really hope you enjoy, uh, you will enjoy the, the reading. Uh, and uh, don't forget, plants are good for your health. Hello, everyone. I'm Julien Rogues, one of the statisticians at Diana Pet Food. And today I'm going to talk about the sensory evaluation of pet food products. The palatability is essential to pet food performance. This word means the capacity of the food or an ingredient to stimulate cats or dogs' appetite, make the pet eat the food, and satisfy the pet during the meal consumption. When we miss palatability, we don't have any food consumption. So the idea is to find some methods and tools to evaluate palatability sensory performance with silent consumers, because obviously cats and dogs doesn't talk, don't talk. And try to look at the relevant measurement criteria and methods which are also meaningful to pet owners. <coughs> the place of the pets in the family is changing, and the owner's expectation towards pet food is changing too. Indeed, the pet has moved from backyard to front yard to kitchen and even to table. And the criteria measured has evolved uh, accordingly. So from acceptability to preference to now what we call enjoyment. So the idea is to evolve also the measurement criteria and to be both pet and human centric. So we moved from consumption measurement and pet centric criteria to pet and human centric criteria assessing pet's immersion and owner perception of the pet product. So, panelists, 
a non-standing tool to assess pet food palatability performance. This tool owns 940 cats and dogs, representing more than 60 different breeds. Panelists perform more than 8,000 palatability tests every year and is present on three expert sites in the USA, in Brazil, and in France. To take care of the animals and to conduct the test, 82 experts, such as animal technicians, ethologists, or statisticians, are recruited to take care of the animals. And what's new about our method? The idea is to obtain an enriched multidimensional answer by using both a panelist expert and what we call a panelist in home. The panelist expert stands to assess product performance with accurate and innovative method on expert panels, but also panelist in home to measure emotional performance and to predict owner satisfaction. These two approach, approaches are here to identify differentiation opportunities for pet food brands by claiming new enjoyment claims. I invite you to buy the book and to read the chapter on the pet food sensory evaluation. And I thank you all for your attention. So now I will ask Liz and Fabrice, um, Thank you to, to be the moderator. So uh, remember that uh, Julien cannot join uh, today. You have only three speakers. So thank you for keeping five minutes per speaker. Like this, uh, we can uh, program to finish at half past five and uh, Julien will conclude. So you can let the floor to Julien at the end. Thank you. Fabrice, do you want to begin? It's up to you. So uh, I will start with uh, the question to uh, to Barbara. Um, I have uh, noticed two questions. The, the first one uh, is regarding the standards that uh, Barbara you are following uh, for preparing material to be sniffed. And in the same topic, I have a, a question at the end uh, that is very also interesting regarding uh, what are the perspective of identifying flavor in products stored in uh, sustainable packaging such as cassava or mushrooms. Yeah, thank you. So you have panel strength for cassava. <laughs> Unfortunately not. Uh, well, uh, concerning <laughs> the first first question, uh, yes, so there are uh, standards available. Um, you can also find a survey about these uh, standards in, in the book chapter, so I will not go into detail. Um, however, uh, you have to differentiate. There, there are standards for, uh, I just opened this page, uh, one is called for all packaging materials uh, uh, except packaging made of paper and cardboard. So you have to differentiate between these two groups, uh, especially uh, because paper and cardboard behave a little bit different uh, uh, with respect to, to migration or sorption of, of volatile compounds uh, and they're very sensitive to differences or variations of humidity of the of the surrounding uh, which is not the case for any any polyolefins or any other traditional plastic material okay uh, so so you have to be careful uh, with which uh, material you work with and to take the the respective standard. Uh, the, the ones on uh, paper and cardboard are more detailed, uh, uh, the, the other ones are more, more general ones. Okay, and working with paper and cardboard is actually more tricky than, than with polyolefins, for example, due to this um, um, sensitivity to, to humidity, for example. Uh, and, and sometimes they act like a, like a sponge. So this is really, really very tricky. Uh, and uh, this uh, brings me also to the to the second question. Well, actually, uh, we have worked only a little bit uh, with uh, new sustainable uh, biodegradable packaging material, but this um, most probably brings uh, completely new questions into into this topic uh, because we know very little about uh, these these materials. We we do not know how they degrade uh, in the contact uh, with oxygen, for example, in contact with UV irradiation. Uh, we know very little um, about the degradation uh, products. I would suppose uh, when they are made from from 
mushrooms or also cassava, that the degradation products would be more uh, similar to food, um, to, to, to compounds that we found in other food materials than degradation products that we find, for example, uh, from polyolefins, from, from polyethylene or, or polypropylene, because there we have completely different uh, starting material than from, from mushrooms. Uh, but probably this makes it even more difficult to differentiate where these compounds come from. Do they come from the packaging material, if it is uh, mushroom-based or, or whatever biodegradable um, uh, material, or does the off-flavor compound uh, come from the food uh, from the food itself? So this would make it probably even a little bit more difficult uh, to identify the off-flavor compounds. So I think there is still uh, quite a lot of work to do in that in that topic. Okay, thank you. There are two minutes left for, for your uh, session. So um, I have also a, a question regarding uh, the sensory threshold that you uh, you mentioned that uh, I think that is very important for all of us. So when uh, you are uh, approached by uh, a client, uh, how do you define this uh, threshold? <laughs> very, very difficult question. <laughs> It's for that reason that I raised this question. Very tricky, you know, to, uh, to, to define it. Is it a, a, a compound that is not that potent at all? Uh, but uh, actually, we did some experiments, for example, with uh, compounds like trichloroamisole uh, uh, as a contaminant for a very frequent contaminant for, for paper and cardboard. Uh, and we determined uh, the thresholds in, in water. We determined them in oil. We know that there is a big difference. Uh, and we determined the thresholds in, uh, in cell on cellulose-based uh, compounds and the threshold is completely different again. Uh, so this is something that we, if you really want to know this threshold, uh, this is a lot of work and a tricky task again, probably easy to, to apply in, in paper-based products because they act like a sponge and, and you could um, apply the, the pure compounds in dilutions quite easily. But what about uh, pellets made from polyolefins, for example, how to bring those compounds into the pellets in, in an appropriate stage? So this is also a technical problem there uh, to, to prepare the matrix for the evaluation of the, of the sensor thresholds. Very, okay. very difficult task. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, Liz, perhaps now you follow with the next section. Okay, so I will um, move on with Mathilde and with your presentation. Uh, there is a first question about um, the recruitment of the panelists. And um, regardless of the, le of the level and size, do you also take into account specific behaviors or movement patterns? like supination versus pronation in your uh, recruitment of panelists or typologies of panelists? Uh, yes, we try to. So, yeah, for example, uh, yeah, supination and pronation, it was for running, but also, for example, if we test uh, like tennis racket, we will uh, recruit uh, left or right-handed people. Yeah, depending on the product, we will try to uh, uh, include some uh, yeah, inclusion criteria specific to the product. And also, uh, sometimes we can check that with uh, bio me biomechanical um, measurements. For example, for supination, pronation, we sometimes uh, think to know uh, what which pattern we have, but uh, we can check that to ensure the good uh, recruitment of uh, people, of panelists. But for example, in a panel, would you mix uh, left-handed and right-handed panelists? Or would you, like for dry skin, uh, would you mix all types of skin? Or uh, No, because uh, sometimes uh, products are uh, made for one type of people. For example, uh, supination, pronation, sometimes uh, uh, shoes are uh, made uh, specifically for one type of runners. So uh, most in this case, we'll try to uh, have specific panelists uh, uh, in accordance. But if uh, the product is uh, uh, more, uh, uh, is for all, uh, all uh, sport people, then uh, we will mix, uh, we'll mix uh, the, the profiles. Okay. Thank you. Then the, there was a question about um, a trained panelists. Um, how do you ensure that products are tested in a representative environment or in a representative usage condition? Um, for example, if I think about uh, tennis rackets, uh, 
Uh, do you ask um, players to, to play uh, several scenario with different, uh, I don't know how to say in English, the different coup, but um, do, you, do you create a, um, a fake scenario that everyone has to, to follow or is it free and you play like you are used to play? Yeah, it depends, but uh, most of the time we will uh, use a fixed scenario in order by, to uh, decrease um, variability between panelists, but also uh, variability between products because uh, yeah, product to be uh, need to be experienced and tested with the we try the with the same uh, same movement, same scenario, but sometimes it's not uh, so easy to reproduce uh, the the same movement. For example. Uh, yeah, if we if you um, are testing a surf, for example, the, it depends on, on the wave. So it's uh, sometimes difficult to reproduce exactly the same movement and the same scenario because you are uh, yeah, depending on the on the condition. And uh, for, is, um, this is for mainly for sensory tests, but for uh, consumer tests, we also um, send product to people so they can uh, test the product in their real usage and uh, is more free so they can use the product in uh, the condition they are using it uh, uh, yeah, with their own habits and uh, as they will do so yeah okay and there was a last last question about train panels as there is a high variability due to many many elements that you have mentioned. Do you usually have uh, more um, trained panelists than in traditionally in food? Yeah, uh, maybe we should, but uh, it's uh, very difficult to, to recruit uh, sport people because uh, yeah, usually products are uh, yeah, made for one specific usage, for one specific type of uh, sport people. And it's uh, very difficult to recruit people. So sometimes we we move a city or country to recruit uh, the uh, to find uh, sport people uh, corresponding to the product. And uh, yeah, so with the difficulty of ref of uh, recruitment, uh, yeah, uh, we cannot uh, have a higher number of panelists. But uh, we try to to train them in order to yeah to that they, they are uh, they have they are performant yeah okay thank you Mathilde I think um... and usually yeah we we don't uh, have uh, like in a food um, in the food uh, food sector we usually we have one or two three descriptors so we can train them uh, more uh, more deeply on these uh, descriptors. Okay, thank you, Mathilde. And maybe Fabrice, I leave you the floor for the questions to Renan. Oh, we can't hear you, you're on mute. Sorry. sorry. Uh, and again, as for the first station, uh, it's a question from Liz again. <laughs> so uh, I'm reading your question. <laughs> So, uh, Renan, uh, the two plant producers use sensory analysis to support sensory communication of the product, sensory claims, or it's only mm. to help them developing uh, plants that are liked. Uh, I guess I have to be honest for the moment. Producers do not use sensory evaluation. Uh, mm. When we do the, the literature for, for, the, for writing the, the, the chapter, we found very few uh, papers, and of course, research and research paper are not uh, the what is happened in the real life in the commercial life but we know that in france we are sure that there is no use of this, this methodology and uh, over the world maybe some some things in canada with short experience uh, maybe in Wageningen or but that it's quite it's not really used uh, there is maybe on the for the rose uh, there is some some specific uh, to promote a specific odor but it's not used. Uh, it's not done with sensory evaluation as we can do. But it's it's done only with a, a perfume expert who make a, a, a short description of the odor, and you can sell with the name of the color and the odor, but done by a, a, a perfume expert. Uh, and I'm sure that there is something to do with sensory evaluation as we can do an odor on this perfume, but not only for rose. Uh, I am just now. I have a project uh, in France 
where we, we are working on the, um, an odor segment, uh, an odor based segmentation for plants. And not just for rows, but you mean you, you enter in your garden center and there is a corner with different, with odor segmentation. If you want something with fruity notes, if you want something with citrus notes, and, and people can select different types if they want to find one odor specific. And we try to, to understand if consumers are sensitive to this way to promote the vegetal to them. But you know, for the moment, it's only some ideas we try. So it's why in the chapters, uh, it's uh, just some uh, examples, or short examples. And, and I, I, I mentioned the potential of this uh, techniques and the sensory we, we use and we all use and the adaptation to that because it's a field that we know that there is some decrease people do not know how to use vegetal they, they do not go to the garden center and we are sure that if we if we have a better understanding of their behavior what they are how they use the vegetal and and for analyze that we need all the techniques we use uh, in food and, and other perfume and, and, and other non-food sector. So for the moment, I have to be honest, not used, and uh, I, I'm, I'm sure if there is a, this potential. But uh, uh, not used for uh, the producer or not used also for the garden center? Because we know that they're a very, very big company uh, in garden mm -hmm. center and perhaps uh, for marketing issue, the, 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 to try to follow. Uh... Only for, for merchandising uh, issue, uh, the yeah. way to sell. Uh, but uh, to, to my knowledge, uh, it's not go into all the, um, the sectors. I mean, to, to, from, from the, so the, the distributors to the breeders. It's, it's not there is no communication so for the distributors there is uh, i have some uh, some contact with some company and and they make some focus groups to understand and and, and uh, um, user experience uh, uh, study uh, uh, inside but they do not continue to the readers to change the way to 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 to, to, to develop new uh, concept and to to all the sectors should integrate this uh, type of uh, of strategy i guess Okay, thank you. So, uh, Anne-Marie, now it's uh, time, I think, to uh, close the, the meeting. Uh, I think we are on time. It's not we are on time. <laughs> perfectly, yes, perfectly on time, um, because Julien is not here. Thank you for the moderators, and I, I let the floor to, to Julien, who will conclude this, uh, this first webinar on non-food sensory practices. Thanks a lot for participants, the moderators and speakers and, uh, for this challenge. For this book. Thank you, Anne-Marie, um, and thank you all the presenters. I think that was a, <laughs> a fascinating workshop, and I'm, I'm so glad that we're, we uh, could uh, um, interact today and that we are having this uh, working group uh, in the E3S. Uh, it's really unique. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I really, I really uh, enjoyed it today. Uh, it's also worth noting that we had uh, 60, about 60, 65 uh, attendees live and many more interested, uh, given what uh, Sarah said about the people who registered but maybe could not uh, attend. So this shows that there's a strong interest for application of sensory science to non-food products. And um, with the, the panel of of presentations uh, that we had today, uh, we could really see that there's a wide and diverse um, um, diversity of, of, uh, of topics, issues, and concerns. Uh, many of them are about the methods, how to apply sensor evaluation to non-food products. Uh, so we've seen uh, issues about uh, how to select panelists and the difference maybe between panelists and volunteers. Um, and also uh, questions about the usage scenarios and context, about uh, uh, efficiency in some cases, uh, like for uh, um, drugs, uh, there were we were really almost touching clinical tests. So there's questions both on safety and efficiency. Uh, the same goes with cosmetic products. Um, also, uh, a recurring question I noted was how to deal with variability. Variability in the conditions, in the in the samples, in the subjects. So all those questions are very interesting. They might not be um, absent in the case of food, 
but they're very, very strong or much stronger in many non-food applications. So I think that's something interesting. And uh, it's it's really uh, interesting to see that uh, uh, there are some questions about how to apply uh, sensory evaluation uh, methods from food and to non-food. And now we can take and learn from from this uh, uh, this experience in non-food products and, and go take them back to uh, to food too. So it's really uh, an interaction. And, and with that, I would also like to, to stress that uh, many of us, like sensory and, and consumer scientists, do not work in on food only. And uh, a few years ago, when we surveyed um, uh, the members of the French society, we realized that about 40% of us uh, worked outside of the food industry which is uh, a lot. Uh, it might not be the same in all countries, but still it's it's a significant number. So uh, I'm really happy that it's um, this group is very active, very lively. Uh, and then um, so with that, I encourage all of you who attended maybe this workshop or who uh, uh, learned about this group for the first time today to, to join the working group. Uh, so for that, you can contact Anne Marie, I guess, or directly or see on the website. I think all the information is on the ETRIAS website. And I think uh, that's it. I will conclude for today. Maybe Sarah or Paola want to um, add something? No. Thank well, you. Not, Thank you, uh, Julien. Thank yeah. you. No, uh, I do not have. Uh, much more to add. And you, you gave all the information. Yes, on the website there are all the information about the book, the, the, the working group, and the recording of the webinar will be available uh, on our uh, E3S YouTube channel soon, just the time to, to set it up. So, thank you. Thank you very much for participating in it. And we, we will have the next meeting uh, webinar in one month uh, in uh, October. And uh, it will be organized by this time by the uh, Taste Sensitivity Working Group. And it will be on the second uh, Wednesday of, uh, of the month uh, as it is this one as as usual so the on the 13th of october same time excellent thank you so much thank, thank you, you all and see you next time for writing your presentations bye bye thank you bye bye bye